Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another lecture of 6837. Uh, today, we're going to continue our discussion of geometry uh, and talk about how to construct curves that are longer than just one cubic segment, and then to take the machinery that we developed for curves and lift it to machinery for actually computing 3D surfaces. Uh, so this will be the sort of main piece of our discussion of geometry in this course, and then we'll move on to hierarchical modeling, animation, and other topics. So to get started, maybe just a quick review. Um, if you recall in our past lecture, essentially we talked about a lot of different techniques for drawing curves that consisted of essentially having the x, y, and z coordinates all be cubic functions of some time variable t. Uh, we talked about a particular technique called de Castel-Jeux algorithm uh, for subdividing a control polygon like what you see uh, on this slide here. So recall, for example, if I wanted to find gamma of one half, there's a very simple uh, algorithm for doing that based on the control polygon, where I take each of the segments, I divide them in half, then I connect those points with line segments, divide these guys in half, connect with the line segment, divide in half again, uh, and there's our point on the curve. You can see I didn't do a particularly good job of drawing this because it didn't align with the green curve, but uh, hopefully you get the point. Um, so I would encourage you uh, every day uh, after you wake up, you know, you have your uh, breakfast, you brush your teeth, and then draw some arbitrary cubic control polygon. If you want, you can make it complicated by intersecting itself. And then try to find a point like gamma of, I don't know, two thirds. And see if you can construct that point based on subdividing uh, the edges in the control polygon. Um, this is really obviously going to be the kind of question that I really like to ask on the exam, and I'll probably find a way to do it, even though our course is currently online. So the castle shows algorithm was nice because it gave us a recursive technique for finding points on cubic curves, uh, but there uh, also is just a way to trace out the entire curve as a closed form function. Um, so specifically, if we had the four control points of a cubic curve, one thing we could do uh, is actually write down the curve as a function of time uh, using the four Bernstein polynomials. Um, so here's the uh, equation of our curve at the end of the day, um, where essentially we take the four cubic control points, like what's drawn in the polygon on the slide, and we just multiply those uh, by these functions of t, and that traces out the curve as if there's a little car that we're driving along at. And remember that one of the kind of funny aspects of uh, drawing a curve on a screen is that even though we've been doing parameterized geometry, right, there's this t variable which is tracing out the car um, as it kind of drives along our uh, curve here, the t variable is sort of irrelevant in the sense that if my car doubled its speed, it would still trace out the same piece of geometry on the screen. Um, so that'll be the case anytime we talk about actually drawing 3D curves. Um, later on, when we talk about animation, that time variable is going to matter. Now, in today's lecture, uh, we're going to look at curves that are more complicated than what we saw in the last lecture, right? So in the last lecture, essentially all we could do was draw U or C-shaped curves or maybe one single loop-to-loop. -loop. Um, but, uh, of course, one thing that I would want to do is replicate my favorite figure in any math textbook. You're seeing it on the slide right now. Uh, and in order to do that, I'm going to need to basically splice together lots of different cubic curves that each just take care of one little piece of the uh, drawing that I'm trying to make. And so today, we're going to talk about machinery for taking multiple curve segments and gluing them together uh, in a way that makes the connection nice and smooth. And that is going to create an object that we'll call a spline. Uh, you might remember from SimCity that they were what, reticulating splines or something when the software was loading. Um, but the reality is a spline is a very simple object. It's just a piecewise polynomial curve with some degree of smoothness where the pieces meet. So like maybe I draw the control points of one curve segment. Uh, I guess usually we draw the control points and then the curve. And now a spline might take that curve and then meet it up with the second one. And what we try to do is at that point where they meet, try to have the derivatives of these curves match uh, so that we get one overall smooth looking object. By the way, today we're gonna use smoothness in kind of a vague way. Um, when you take calculus class, we often talk about smooth functions as being infinitely differentiable. We're gonna see that that's almost impossible to 
obtain in an interesting way for cubic curves. So we'll probably satisfy ourselves with C1 and C2. Uh, and we'll talk about the definitions of those in a little bit. So we're going to refine that term smoothness uh, specifically for this spline setting. Now, before we dive into the details, I thought you'd give, I'd give you a bit of a trivia fact. Uh, the word spline dates back much earlier than computer technology. Uh, it actually refers, I believe, to a woodworking process like what you're seeing on the screen. Um, and this has its history uh, in chip making and other uh, sort of carpentry processes that require having bent pieces of wood. Um, in fact, if you've taken a few physics classes, I encourage you to write down the equations of a spline and see if you can convince yourself uh, using a bit of variational calculus that, that this is really what should happen. Uh, but essentially, the history of splines is that if I wanted to make a curved boat hole, um, most pieces of wood, of course, come in a straight line or in whatever the shape of the tree happened to be. Uh, so you would have a task uh, on your, your plate, which is to take that piece of wood and bend it to your wheel to fit the shape of your boat. Uh, so one way that you could do that is, by the way, I'm a theoretician. I'm going to talk as if I've ever worked with a piece of wood, but that's completely false. Uh, but my understanding <laughs> of what you would do uh, is you take your piece of wood and heat it up in kind of a humid environment so that it's bendy. And then you can bend it uh, to take the shape of a particular object. So you see uh, on the slide here uh, this shape of the boat hole. And then you would pin it down at a few points um, that are basically controlling the shape. And then because the wood is nice and warm and moist, uh, it kind of fills in a smooth curve in between. Uh, and one of the really amazing byproducts of basically Newtonian physics is that the resting shape of the wood, if you just pin it at a few points, is one of these piecewise cubic uh, curves, which is kind of amazing. Um, so in this class, when we draw splines, uh, we're also simulating uh, little pieces of wood uh, being bent around. Um, and in fact, these little points where you pin the wood, like what you're seeing on the screen here, uh, like right here, are often called knots, uh, which corresponds with the uh, uh, terminology that we use in splines quite a bit. Okay, so our plan for today is before we define all the things we need to, to construct a spline, we're first going to talk about the geometry of curves more generally. And now I don't just mean cubic curves, but just general curves. I'm actually a differential geometry professor, so I'm sort of morally obligated to introduce you guys to the basics here. Um, then we're going to talk about how to glue cubic splines together, and we're going to introduce yet another basis for cubic curves called B-splines, uh, whose design is basically intended to make it easy to glue together multiple curve uh, segments. Uh, from there, we'll talk about how to use the machinery we've already developed for curves to compute 3D surfaces um, in two different techniques, both tensor product surfaces uh, and subdivision surfaces. So let's get started. Our main task today is pretty straightforward. Um, in our last lecture, we talked about how to draw simple curve segments like what we see on the left-hand side. And essentially, we are going to make longer curves by gluing them together uh, at these joint points. And we want them to glue together in a smooth or at least differentiable fashion. I, re I really shouldn't be using this word smooth uh, because mathematically it's not quite correct. But you can see, for example, that the blue and the green curve or the one on the left and the one on the right meet with a common tangent, uh, which is making them look as if they join together in a seamless fashion. And that's really what we're after today. So in order to talk about how to glue together curves, uh, one thing we might start with is just talking a little bit more about the mathematics of curves uh, and how mathematics understands it when you glue curves together. This is going to be super important um, because now we kind of alluded to it in the previous lecture. We've already discussed issues that can happen because we're using parameterized geometry, right? Like if I drive along a curve, then the velocity of the car doesn't matter. And in fact, like let's say that my car gets to some point and then suddenly hits up the gas and doubles its speed. So all the passengers in the car experience all kinds of crazy force. But if the car is continuing to drive along the smooth road, you might not even notice it geometrically. Uh, and so that um, was the big motivating factor behind an area of math called differential geometry, which basically aims to separate out the machinery from calculus we need to define objects like curve 
from the machinery that we need to talk about their geometry. So we're going to talk a little tiny, tiny bit about that today. Um, if you like that stuff, I encourage you to take my graduate course, 6838, where we basically spend the whole semester doing this kind of stuff. Uh, and then we're going to talk about how it's relevant to spline curves. So we're talking an awful lot about joining two curves together with a smooth tangent. Um, and as you guys probably remember from calculus class, you can get the tangent to a curve by talking about its velocity. So here I've given you a curve in the uh, Bernstein basis, right? So P1, P2, P3, and P4 are the control points of the curve. Uh, and these four functions of T are the uh, four Bernstein functions. So the first thing that we might want to do is compute the velocity of our little car as it drives along the curve, right? Because there's actually nothing guaranteed here that our curve is parameterized by arc length. That is, our car doesn't have to drive with constant speed. It might be speeding up and slowing down as it traces out this curve. Okay, so how do we compute velocity of a curve? Hopefully you remember from calculus class that it's just computing a derivative. Uh, and in fact, we can differentiate P of T by differentiating the uh, four uh, basis functions here. And what are we gonna get? We'll get P prime of T is equal to, I'm going to try and do this without glancing at the next slide, but that's probably a mistake. Um, well, so the derivative of 1 minus t cubed is going to be 3 times 1 minus t squared minus 1 um, times p1 plus, uh, well, I think you guys all know how to differentiate all these terms. So through the magic of PowerPoint here, I'll uh, fill in the remaining ones. So notice that for, to get from the curve to its velocity is nothing more than differentiating everything in T. Hopefully you can see that all of these terms, like the first coefficient is the derivative of the first coefficient in time and so on. And of course you can do a quick uh, sanity check at T equals zero and T equals one to make sure your curve ends up at the right place with the right velocity. Now, here's the thing. Let's say that I have two cubic curves, right? So here's one, oops. Um, here's one cubic curve, then I have a point, here's a second cubic curve, and the question is, what has to happen for the velocity of my car driving along this curve when it gets to this point where the two curves meet? Now, I told you that they have tangent continuity, and so that might lead you to enforce that the velocity of the car has to match on the two sides of that point. But that's actually a condition that's a little bit stronger uh, than is necessary. In particular, if the car suddenly accelerates, right, it speeds up, but it continues moving along the same curve, the geometry of the curve isn't going to sense that. And so really what matters is not that the velocities match, but rather a vector that looks like V divided by the norm of V. Right? Remember, that's a unit vector in the velocity direction. Um, so this uh, vector is called the tangent vector to your curve, or sometimes we call it the, uh, the unit tangent. And essentially, it's just a unit vector that's pointing in the direction that my parameterization is moving, but without any length, or, or rather with length one, I guess is the right way to put it. Uh, so... This is essentially the sort of relevant piece of information geometrically. Again, the speed with which my car drives along um, this, this curve, in other words, thinking about this as a function of time, is going to be useful for animation, but for geometry, it really doesn't matter, right? Even if you speed up through the curve, uh, you're still tracing out the same shape. Of course, whenever you see a formula like this, you should make a quick sanity check and ask yourself, well, does this equation make any sense? Um, and of course, it typically does, but one thing that we have to be a little bit worried about is this denominator here. Uh, in particular, um, we don't want our car to slow down to a halt, get velocity zero, uh, and then turn around and drive somewhere else. And that can actually happen with cubic curves. You can get something called a cusp, right? So in a cusp, uh, what will happen in your curve is maybe you drive up to a point, your velocity goes to zero, then you turn your steering wheel and you drive off, and the passengers in your car actually don't sense um, this sudden change in tangent vector. And the reason is that the car drove to a halt as it got to this point before it turned around and then sped up again. 
Uh, and so typically what we do in differential geometry just to avoid this case is to define an object called a regular curve, which is essentially a curve for which P prime is non-zero. In other words, we just don't want that to happen. Okay, so if we want two cubic curves to match up with each other in a way that has the same tangent, that doesn't mean that the vectors uh, V have to match on the two sides of this point, but rather just that the unit tangents have to. So now we're gonna start getting a clue on how to glue together our cubic curves. Let's talk about one additional vector which is relevant to understanding the geometry of a curve. And that's something called the curvature vector. Um, and again, this, this piece of information is a little bit just more for fun, uh, just in case this is an area of math that strikes your fancy. Um, obviously the tangent vector isn't quite enough to fully describe a curve. You need an additional information, which is its curviness, <laughs> right? Um, so in particular, I want to distinguish a straight line from a circular arc and so on. And so the way that we do that is we look at the second derivative of our curve, um, which is like the derivative of the unit tangent vector. Uh, this is called the curvature vector. Uh, and it essentially, uh, you can think about it as the force that the car experiences um, just by virtue of not leaving the road. Okay, so if I have my little car and I'm driving along the road here, even if I'm driving my car with constant speed, so in other words, like, you know, if I hit on the accelerator, obviously I'd, I'd feel a force pulling me back in my chair. If I don't hit on the accelerator, the passengers in the car are still going to feel some force as I turn my steering wheel. And that force is essentially the curvature of the uh, 2D curve. Um, there's one fun fact. Um, so the curvature looks like the derivative of the unit tangent. Um, and you can show that that's actually always going to be orthogonal to the unit tangent. Just for fun, let's actually prove that. That's one of my favorite little facts from differential geometry. So remember um, that the definition of the unit tangent makes it the case that the norm of the unit tangent is always equal to one, even if you think of this as a function of time little t. Okay? Remember that I can get the norm of a vector by taking the dot product of the vector in itself. Oops. So in other words, I can write one equals t, the uh, unit tangent of time, dot product, unit tangent of time. And now let's take the derivative of both sides with respect to t. Well, the derivative of one with respect to time is zero. And by the product rule, the derivative of the right-hand side is two big T dot big T prime, which looks like the curvature of my curve, T of T dot curvature of T. So if you kind of read off, one thing you'll see is that the tangent and the curvature when you take their drop product is equal to zero, which means that they're orthogonal vectors. Um, so this is actually just a byproduct of the fact that you differentiated a unit vector. It turns out that just this one fact gets you pretty far in the area of, of math called differential geometry, although math professors don't like you to know that. Okay, so there's all kinds of different interpretations for this curvature vector. Another nice one is that if you look at one over the curvature, or at least its norm, um, it's like the radius of a uh, circle that touches your curve just barely. Notice as a sanity check that if the curvature is zero, right, that means that your curve is a line. Um, and one over that is infinity, which kind of makes sense, right? Because the radius of the circle that touches a straight line is kind of like infinity because it's like a really, really ginormous uh, circle. So the curvature vector has non-zero uh, norm, um, but sometimes we normalize that thing too. And what you get is something called the normal vector to your curve. In two dimensions, it's a pretty straightforward picture. Essentially, the tangent vector points parallel to the direction that your car is driving. And the normal vector just points 90 degrees to the right. The picture gets a little more complicated in 3D, but we're not gonna worry about that in, in this course. Okay, so anyway, this is just a uh, whirlwind introduction to a bit of language from differential geometry. Uh, for the most part, you don't need it in 6837, but it's worth being aware of at least the difference between the velocity and the tangent to a curve. Right? Remember, the velocity is the derivative in time t, and the tangent is the unit vector 
in the velocity direction. So the tangent is kind of like the geometric object and the velocity is kind of like the information that's relevant to the parameterization. So as an aside and a little bit of an advertisement, if you like this kind of thing um, in the spring in 2021, we'll see if it's <laughs> online or in person or some combination thereof. Um, I'll be teaching a course called Shape Analysis, where we'll talk about all of these ideas uh, in much, much, much more detail. Um, so we'll actually, our, our, our first lecture in 6838 is all about the analysis of curves. We'll talk not only about curvature uh, and torsion, but also essentially the difference between analyzing a curve and analyzing things like knotted up fibers. Um, and, and the first assignment in the course is usually actually to um, implement a tool for simulating uh, that kind of dynamics, which is pretty cool. So anyway, if you have any questions about 6838, do uh, uh, reach out to me and I'm always excited to tell you more about that or my, my own research uh, in this particular space. But for now, let's go back to computer graphics. So remember, I keep alluding to the fact that I'm using this word smooth, right? I want to take two cubic curve segments and have them meet together in a smooth way. But we don't really mean smooth. We mean maybe continuous or differentiable. Um, and now we're going to dive a little bit into what that means more formally. So specifically, I claim that there's at least two different notions of smoothness or, or differentiability that might be relevant for these cubic curves or piecewise cubic curves that we keep talking about. Um, and those are illustrated on the slide here. There's parametric continuity, there's geometric continuity. And so what I've given you uh, in these two boxes are examples of curves that are continuous in one definition and not continuous in the other. Just to get you a little bit confused, you know? Um, so in particular, consider on the left-hand side, uh, the function gamma of t equals t squared comma t cubed. Now, if I didn't give you this plot, I'm covering it with my hand, but I'm, I guess you can't actually see that I'm doing that on the uh, recording here. Um, but in any event, if I just gave you this function here, I think we would all agree that it's differentiable, right? I mean, you could compute derivatives of gamma of t until the cows come home. In fact, I guess if you compute more than three, you'll just get zero. But now, let's say that I plot this thing as a parametric curve, right? So now I drive my car along that curve um, as a function gamma of t, right? So remember, gamma of t is like the position of the car at time t. And he chugs along the curve until he reaches the uh, origin here. And what happens with the origin? Well, let's, let's compute the derivative. So gamma prime of t is equal to, oops. It's really a problem being left-handed using this Microsoft Surface. So gamma prime of t is equal to 2t comma 3t squared. So in particular, gamma prime of 0 is just equal to 0 comma 0. OK? So what does that mean? That means at time 0, well, gamma prime is equal to 0. So in other words, the car comes to a halt, right? So I'm driving along this car. This, this curve, rather, I reach this point, and the velocity goes to zero for just an infinitesimal fraction of a second. But during that fraction of a second, I jerk my steering wheel, and I drive off in another direction. So the passengers in the car actually experience a smooth ride because the car came to a halt before it drove off in another direction. And that's what's making it a parametric continuous function. Right? This is infinitely differentiable as a function of t, but as a piece of geometry, there's this crazy feature here called a cusp. Right? We already talked about that earlier. Now, on the right-hand side, I've given you a different example. So here is a function gamma of t. This is actually a piecewise polynomial gamma of t. So when t is negative, the uh, function that's tracing gamma of t is t comma t squared. And when t is positive, is t squared t to the fourth. Notice that in both of these cases, we have that y is equal to x squared, right? t squared is equal to t squared, <laughs> and t to the fourth is equal to t squared squared. Yeah? So how should we describe what's going on in this curve? Well, essentially, 
We're driving along the negative part of the curve. The car gets to the origin here. And then suddenly the car jams on its accelerator and starts driving a heck of a lot faster. But it's still driving along the same parabolic shape road. So overall, this curve is still geometrically continuous because the two segments meet up with the same tangent vector, even though they don't have the same velocity vector. This is an important point, so I encourage you guys to ask questions about it, uh, and we can draw lots of examples of things that are parametrically continuous but not geometrically continuous and vice versa. Okay, so now let's make a few definitions. Essentially, we can talk about a term called the order of continuity, which defines the behavior of two curves that meet at a point. You can see that I'm pointing at them with the arrow here. So what we can say is that my curve is C0 if the two curve segments are continuous at that point, but the seam could be a sharp kink or the car could drive off in a completely different direction uh, and so on. By the way, if a curve isn't C0, that would be like two segments that like don't even meet up. Okay. And now um, let's talk about different notions of differentiability. So a curve can be G1, which is sort of shorthand for geometric continuity, meaning that the tangents are the same. That's the second case that I show you here. Um, so that would be kind of like the case that we showed uh, on the right-hand side of the previous slide. Like it could be that my car and my two cubic functions that are meeting up at this point, like quadruples in speed, but I don't see it if I just know the path that the car took, but not the speed that it had. A stronger, typically, but not always, condition uh, is parametric continuity, or C1, which is that the velocities match on the two sides of the uh, seam. And then the strongest possible condition, um, well, not the strongest possible, but typically the strongest one that people use or think about in um, graphics is C2, um, which informally is known as curvature continuity, um, meaning that the tangents and the derivatives of the tangents are the same. I would argue that actually G2 is probably the curvature continuous curve, and this is like twice differentiable, but we're not gonna get too caught up on it. Essentially what it's saying is that the first and second derivatives of the curves uh, match up on the two sides. So the two really important cases to get right are G1 and C1, um, and these correspond to the tangents aligning versus the velocities aligning. Um, you can see that C1 somehow looks a little bit less like there's a kink at that place where they match. Um, but specifically for animation, like, this can be really important, right? Because, like, for instance, I'm animating a roller coaster. Um, remember that, you know, F equals MA. <laughs> so you can experience uh, acceleration, not, uh, not just... Uh, changes in position but changes in velocity um, so your roller coaster would be really uncomfortable at a point that's g1 but not c1 Whew. okay so now that we've gotten all this out of the way let's return to our cubic control polygon and talk about what it means to take cubic bezier curves and have them meet up with a particular degree of continuity so remember that I can define a cubic Bezier curve using four control points. So like for instance, these four points to find the curve on the left-hand side. And let's say that I wanna draw a second curve and have it meet up with that one. Like that. Then the condition, or the question that you might ask rather is what conditions do I need to put on the control points right, these four points that define our two cubic segments here, to ensure different types of geometric continuity. Now, I'm going to try and pause as I describe this because I do want you to think about it critically before I answer, and that's just a little bit tricky uh, when I'm giving an online lecture. But first, how might we guarantee C0 continuity? Remember, that means that just your two curves meet up at a point. Well, that one's pretty simple. Essentially, what you want is that the last control point of one of your curves equals the first control point of the next curve. Okay, so now let's uh, think about the more complicated conditions, namely G1 and C1 continuity. So remember, this means that not only do the curves touch each other, but that their derivatives match in some fashion. So first, let's think about G1 continuity, meaning that 
the tangent on the left hand side matches the tangent on the right hand side. Now, if you remember from the previous lecture, um, the velocity right at t equals 1 of a uh, cubic Bezier curve is a vector that's parallel to the difference between the last two control points. And similarly, the velocity at the outset of the next cubic curve is like the difference uh, between the first two, right? So like p2 minus p1 on the second segment and uh, p4 minus p3 on the first segment. So if I want to guarantee g1 continuity, I mean, I'm going to put bars on top of the p's for the second segment just to distinguish them from one another. Oops, that was kind of a big bar. Then uh, what do I need? Well, I need not that these two vectors are equal, that would be too strong, but I need them to be parallel, right? That's enough to share tangent, but not necessarily velocity, right? So we want P4 minus P3 parallel to P2 minus P1, right? And so that would give me G1 continuity. And if I want C1 continuity, well, it would be the same thing, except now I actually want these two vectors to be equal to one another. Now, to get continuity above G1 and C1, you can write down the conditions in terms of these control points, but it gets kind of hard to guess what it is from the picture. So I'll let you do that at home or not, because they're not terribly important conditions to know. Okay, so here's a picture of a uh, cubic Bezier curve. Um, so one question you might ask is where is this uh, curve, which is built out of a bunch of cubic segments, um, C0 continuous, G1 continuous, and C1 continuous. So you can see, for example, that it's only C0 here, right? The tangent vector changes. Um, you can see at this joint, well, what's going on at this joint? I think these two segments are about the same length. So in other words, it's C1 here. Uh, and now if I look at this joint, for example, well, the left and right hand sides are parallel, but the length is not the same for sure. So this would only be G1, it's supposed to be a G. Okay, so hopefully you guys understand essentially the difference between C0, C1, and G1, uh, and that you also understand uh, how you can see that based on the uh, cubic Bezier curse. Now, a question you can ask at home, it's, it's gonna show up on your homework as well, um, is the relationship between the uh, number of control points and the number of Bezier subcurves. I think typically what we think about is what if we want a bunch of curves that at least meet up in a C0 fashion? So then like the first four control points define the first segment, but then how many points define the second segment? Well, I have to reuse one of the control points. So I only need three more to get the next segment and so on. So you can do a bit of degree of freedom counting to uh, figure out precisely how many control points um, you need to specify a number of subcurves or vice versa. Okay. So the nice thing is that it's really easy to look at the control points for a bunch of cubic Bezier segments and ask yourself if they meet up with C1 or G1 continuity. Again, essentially you just check if the segments on the two sides are parallel and or are the same length, right? That's the difference between G1 and C1. But if I'm trying to make 3D modeling software or not even 3D modeling software, just 2D modeling software like PowerPoint or Illustrator, this might be kind of annoying because essentially it requires constraints that link the control points together, right? So if I want to draw two cubic Bezier curves that meet at a point and I want to force myself to have them meet in a C1 or a G1 way, then I can't move the uh, control points that are circled on the slide here in an arbitrary fashion, right? If I move one, I have to move the other to maintain that these two line segments are parallel to uh, one another. And these sorts of constraints can get kind of annoying for artists, right? Because I don't have local control, right? I, I change one degree of freedom and some other degree of freedom has to change as well. So 
one more basis that people introduce for cubic curves is something called a cubic B-spline. And this is a sort of a popular uh, notion of a cubic curve uh, because it makes it easy to make your curves meet up with different degrees of continuity. But the drawback is going to be, like what you can see on this slide, the curve doesn't actually interpolate your data. It doesn't touch any of the control points. So these are locally cubic uh, uh, functions. They're defined by at least four control points, and they're going to make it super easy to meet up more than, than one uh, cubic segment at a time. And the way that we're going to do it, which is really sneaky, uh, is as follows. So the first segment of a cubic B-spline curve, which is, again, just a bunch of chained together cubics, um, the first segment is going to be defined by the first four control points, like what we've marked on the red, uh, on, on the slide in red uh, here. What do you think the control points are going to be of the next segment of the curve? Well, I'm just going to get rid of P1, and I'm going to introduce P5 into the mix. And that's going to give me the control points for another curve. And the kind of cool thing about the cubic B-spline basis is if two segments have these three points in common, and I just kind of pop the first point um, off of the list of control points and add on a new one onto the end, then the point at which they meet will have at least C1 continuity. That's the sort of design of the B-spline basis, and so on. I can keep chaining these things together. So maybe I pop off point P2 and I add on point P6 here. I get another segment. Notice, once again, they meet up with C1 continuity and so on. And so essentially a cubic B-spline segment is still defined by four control points, but the segment itself is different um, and it doesn't have to pass through any of the control points. Although one thing you can convince yourself uh, is that it passes through the convex hole of the uh, control points. One thing that we're not going to do in class today, but I encourage you to work out at home, um, is that uh, if you want to use the cubic blossom for uh, computing a cubic B-spline, you can do that. Um, and essentially, remember that like when I did a cubic Bezier curve, what were the labels of my points? It was like 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. Um, if you want a cubic B-spline, you'll do 0, 1, 2, 1, 2, 3, 2, 3, 4, three, four, five. And if you want a really challenging exercise for home, I would encourage you to work out uh, what the analogy is of the uh, de castel -Jo algorithm, right? Like what if I want f of, I guess, 2.5, since this goes from zero to five. And I can do it uh, just using the same um, cubic blossom properties, right? Like the affine property and symmetry. Uh, but the construction is a little more tricky. But anyway, that's an advanced topic. You don't have to worry about it. Um, a different thing, way to think about it is just that we have a new basis uh, for a different type of cubic curve that's still defined by four points, uh, but essentially it's just a different curve. <laughs> um, so here are the cubic B-spline basis functions. you notice it's not the same as the Bernstein uh, basis, um, but they're sort of designed in a fashion to make your curves meet up uh, in a nice way. Um, in fact, actually, just by looking at these uh, functions, it's not too hard to convince yourself that the curve has to lie in the convex hull of the control points. And that's just because the functions are positive and sum to one. Okay, so uh, here I've given you on the slide our favorite uh, matrix. Uh, remember from our previous lecture, we can always factor a, a cubic curve uh, by writing the geometry uh, matrix, the basis matrix, and the monomials. So here is the uh, basis matrix for B-spline functions. Obviously, in a course like 6837, I'm not going to ask you to memorize this sort of thing. And you're going to get a lot of practice with it on the homework, which will help you sort of understand why to use these different basis functions and how to convert between them. OK, so the basic idea here that you should take home is this idea of windowing, namely that I can make two cubic B-splines um, segments fit together by just making sure that they share three control points, although the ordering changes.
Uh, and by doing that, one thing you can convince yourself is that this is automatically a C2 curve. There's actually no need to manually add constraints to match the tangents together. Um, if you like the uh, basis functions, there's a nice illustration down here sort of showing you how they meet together in a way that makes a uh, twice differentiable curve. Okay, so let's uh, take a look here. So on the left-hand side, we see a typical uh, B-spline uh, curve. Uh, and basically, the segments here are gotten from like the first four points, right? And then plugging in the B-spline functions uh, to trace out some segment like, well, I don't know, probably something like that. And then um, to get the next segment that joins onto it with uh, C2 uh, continuity here, I have these control points. And then to get the next segment that glues onto it again with C2 uh, continuity, um, I'll have these control points. Uh, and so on. And you can see that our, our whole curve here in green is a nice smooth uh, curve that interpolates the data. Now, of course, sometimes it's useful to model a curve with a derivative discontinuity. Um, there's a sneaky way that you can do that in B-spline language. This is just a fun fact. I don't think you need to uh, memorize it. So, for example, you can see a kink in my curve here. Um, the one way that I can pull that off, uh, which is pretty straightforward, is actually just to repeat a control point twice. Uh, and in fact, if you want the uh, curve to go through a specified point, you can just keep repeating it and eventually it, it will. So that, that's one way to uh, begin and end uh, at specified places, because otherwise you'll uh, begin in some kind of funny spot on your B-spline. Now, there's a couple things that are worth knowing. Um, one is that Bezier and B-spline curves are not the same. So we already talked about Bezier uh, curves in our previous lecture. Remember, those are the ones uh, that are defined by four control points. So in this diagram, we're choosing the control points so that they meet up with C0 continuity, right? So here I'll mark kind of every fourth one. Um, you know, so every set of four points here defines a new segment along our uh, curve system. But if I reuse the same set of points um, in the... Uh, the B spline basis, notice I get a different curve. These are just different objects geometrically. Um, and in fact, the number of segments is even different, right? So here I have one, two, three, four segments in my uh, Bezier curve. But how many cubic segments are there in the B spline? Well, they have to overlap more in their control points. So they've got one, two, three, oops, and so on. Um, so it would be one, I guess two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So there's ten uh, segments here, I think. You guys can check me and comment on Piazza if I got it wrong. Whereas here, there's one, two, three, four segments um, uh, worth of, of Bezier curves. So that's the thing that you should sanity check at home and make sure you understand. Okay, so how do we convert between Bezier and B-spline curves? This is actually really important. So when we talk about curve segments, right, that's like just one cubic piece, both the Bezier basis functions and the B-spline basis functions, and by the way, the Hermite basis and the monomials, we've talked about quite a few now, all of them are just different bases for cubic curves, right? So they're all dimension four right, because of one t, t squared, and t cubed. And what that means is that there's no cubic segment that can be written in one basis but not the other. It's just that you would need different sets of control points, right? Like the set of control points I need to define a Bezier uh, segment would be different from the set of control points I need to define the same segment but as a B-spline. In any event, let's say that I wanted to convert my control points from Bezier to B-spline or vice versa. There's actually a really sneaky way that I can do it. So remember that I can write a curve um, by using this factorization we introduced in the previous lecture. There's a geometry matrix. This contains the control points as its uh, columns. There's a spline basis uh, matrix. Right, so this would be like the thing that converts the monomials into the Bezier B spline functions. And then there's the uh, vector of monomial values. 
But let's say that I have some other matrix B, oops, I don't know why this keeps happening, uh, B bar, which contains a new basis for cubic uh, curves that I'd like to use instead. Uh, and the question is, can I get the control points of that curve uh, instead? And there's a really sneaky way that I can do that. Now, remember the B bar, if I multiply it by its inverse, what do I get? Well, I just get the identity matrix, right? So in particular, um, let's see here. I'm going to want, uh, yeah, like that equals the identity matrix, right? So let's see here. Well, clearly I can say that this is equal to G times B times the identity matrix times T of T, right? I can always multiply identity matrices in there any way that I want. And now I'm going to insert our new expression, oops, which is G times B. And now I'm gonna say B bar inverse, B bar uh, like that, right? That's just the identity times the monomials again. And let's say that I just group this expression like that. <laughs> well, notice, this entire thing, we can call it G bar. Well, now I have G bar times B bar times T. So this matrix that I've bracketed on the left is exactly the set of control points in the new basis uh, for functions B bar. Yeah, so all this is a long-winded way to say that if I wanna convert from one cubic basis into another, um, all I have to do is multiply by the basis matrix of one and the inverse basis matrix of the other on the right-hand side to the geometry. Now, if you're like me and you constantly get the order of these products wrong, um, that's completely understandable. Um, this is not the kind of formula you should just memorize and use, but rather one that is simple enough to just convince yourself it's true and kind of rederive it anytime you need it. Um, so if you don't understand this formula, do spend some time kind of bonding with it. And if you're stuck, uh, talk to me or the TAs and we're happy to provide some clarifications. Okay. Um, right. So, uh, here we've written it in more complicated, uh, PowerPoint notation, but notice that, uh, basically the, the thing I already wrote is, is, is hiding here too, right? So here's that B inverse, uh, sitting on the right. Okay. Um, so what does that mean in practice? What that means is that like, if I have a Bezier curve segment, like what I've shown you in the left, I can come up with a different set of four control points. In this case, they're kind of crazy um, on the right, which gives exactly the same cubic segment uh, as a B-spline curve. Uh, and uh, similarly, I can go in the reverse direction if I wanted to, right? So here um, on the, the bottom row, I started with... Uh, uh, B spline curve. Notice it does not interpolate the uh, control points. And by applying that formula on the previous slide, I can get a set of control points um, in the uh, Bezier basis just for that one cubic segment. Now, where matters get a little bit more complicated and annoying to think about uh, is when you splice together multiple curves. I believe you're going to do this on your homework. Uh, remember, we talked about how the number of control points is different because uh, the B-spline curves meet up with a higher degree of continuity. Um, so in that case, you're going to have to kind of loop together. For example, the B-splines, you'll have to take them in groups of four and then overlap three at a time like that and convert um, to go from B-spline to Bezier. Just one additional term that is not needed in this course, but I thought you might want to know what it is because it does show up in graphics quite a bit. Um, it's something called NURBS. This is a fancy acronym for non-uniform rational B-spline. Um, essentially, uh, this allows for a richer class of, of curves. So NURBS curves uh, and eventually NURBS surfaces essentially add more control um, to the geometry of your curve. And the way that they do that is not just by using polynomial functions, but actually using rational functions. You're allowed to divide two polynomials by each other. Um, and essentially the way that this is done is by introducing a homogeneous coordinate into the control points. Um, so we'll talk about uh, homogeneous geometry in the next lecture. Uh, and if you want an advanced topic, you might think about um, drawing splines with not just X, Y, and Z coordinate functions, but also homogeneous coordinate W. So anyway, this is just a bit of foreshadowing. Um, keep it in the back of your mind if you want 
asked me after our uh, lecture on homogeneous coordinates, and we'll talk about how to define a NURBS curve. Okay, so that concludes our discussion of curves. So our next task is to talk about modeling smooth surfaces. Now, modeling surfaces could be the topic of many, many courses, like multiple ones uh, here at MIT, both on the artistic side, on the technical side, the software design side, and so on. Um, and of course, in this course, we reserve about 30 minutes to discuss this very complicated matter. Um, there are many other advanced courses, both in EECS and other departments like mechanical engineering and aero astro that really dive into detail on this rich and, and really cool uh, topic. Um, but we're just going to do a, a little bit of a superficial job here and, and show you the kind of math um, that goes into defining smooth surfaces. And on your homework, you'll get a little bit of practice uh, implementing some of this as well. So there's a ton of different representations for surfaces. The uh, typical representation that is used behind the scenes is something called a uh, triangle mesh, or just a giant triangle, of tri a big pile of triangles. Uh, and that's roughly what your graphics card, your, your graphics processing unit, your GPU, uh, knows how to draw. But just like our motivation for curves, um, triangle meshes are hard to edit and work with. Um, so in applications like computer-aided design and, and, and others, um, like architecture, um, it's very typical to work with representations of smooth curves, just like we started by talking about polylines when we talked about curves, and then we moved to things like uh, differentiable cubic things. There are many other uh, representations of surfaces as well that we'll touch upon today. It will come up a little bit more in this course, but are mostly left to uh, more advanced courses. That includes subdivision, We'll see that's like taking a simple surface and a rule for adding more detail to it and then iterating that rule many times. Implicit surfaces, which are very similar to implicit curves, which you already talked about. Um, and something we'll talk about a bit when we talk about animation is procedural surfaces. And these are essentially just surfaces where you write a piece of code that generates it. Um, so oftentimes, for example, procedural geometry might show up in computer-aided uh, design of video game levels or street sign, you know, streets with lots of buildings and so on. Um, these are the type of procedural routines where there are many repeated patterns, but they're not just simple surfaces. They're really pieces of code uh, that are generated on the fly. So the basic 3D surface representation used behind the scenes is something called a triangle mesh. Actually, more recently, we're starting to use it for 3D modeling and other tasks as a the uh, areas of geometry processing get more sophisticated. Um, but these are really simple. They can be rendered directly, um, but they're not smooth, right? They're composed of lots of little facets. So you need a ton of triangles to approximate a smooth surface. Um, and they're hard to edit, right? Like if I took the bunny here and I wanted to like make his, I don't know, back a little bit taller, I would have a lot of vertices I would have to move around. It's not totally obvious the right editing operations that I present to an artist to do that on a triangle mesh. They exist, and, and plenty of people do that, um, but it's not the high-level control that a lot of areas uh, prefer. That said, um, remember we already talked about this uh, procedure called tessellation, where you take a high-level representation and convert it into a low-level one. Uh, and just like we talked about tessellating curves by sampling points along them, um, the very typical thing to do would be to tessellate a representation of a smooth surface by tiling it with triangles. And one thing we're going to see is that the smooth surface representations that we'll talk about today are very easily uh, tessellated or triangulated um, in a fashion that uh, makes them easier to render behind the scenes. Uh, in fact, some graphics cards even have hardware built in for uh, tessellation um, for certain surface representations. So. How could we define a 3D surface in a smooth fashion using the machinery that we've already built up in the previous lecture and today's lecture? So one thing that we could do is essentially take a curve and then sweep it along another curve, uh, and this is going to give us a surface. So here I've given you a curve uh, P of U. You can see this is in the, uh, the Bezier basis. Um, notice I've replaced like before when we were talking about curves, we use variable t. Now we're going to use u instead. That's because our surfaces are going to be a function of both u and v. And now um, what we're going to do is we're going to take the control points of this cubic curve, 
And we're gonna drag those along other curves so that at any point in time, I have some new set of control points that defines a new cubic curve, right? So as I do that, what am I gonna end up doing? I'm gonna end up tracing out a surface. Is that sneaky or what? So let's uh, make this a little bit more formal. Essentially, I'm gonna make the control points of this black curve that I've already drawn, I'm gonna make them a function of a second parameter that I'll call V, right? So when V equals zero, that'll give me sort of the left boundary of my surface patch here. And when V equals one, that'll give me the right boundary of the same surface patch. So in other words, I'm gonna make the four control points of my cubic curve move along curves themselves. Hopefully I'm not losing you guys in the abstraction. Essentially, I'm just taking a curve and sweeping it along to draw out a surface. Now, of course, the question you should ask is, how do you think I'm gonna represent these functions P of V? Well, take a look at the red dotted line on the image that I've already shown you. Essentially, if I slice my image in the horizontal direction, I also draw out curves. So I'm gonna think of P1 of V, P2 of V, P3 of V, and P4 of V as curves themselves, uh, essentially tracing out this other direction, V of my surface, instead of the U1 that we already talked about. Okay, and that's gonna give us some picture like this. And so as I do that, what I end up with is a two-dimensional surface patch that's like the locus of all of these little cubic curves being dragged along um, actually, cubic curves in the other direction. So this idea, I think, actually mathematically looks complicated, but it's really straightforward. I'm just taking curves and sweeping them along other curves to make a surface. Uh, and this is a construction known as a tensor product uh, patch. And specifically, if I use Bezier curves all the way down, we call them a tensor product Bezier patch. So in particular, we already drew the black curve as a Bezier curve, right, with four control points. If I slice in this direction, like in the V direction, and I also use a Bezier curve for those P1, P2, P3, and P4 of V functions, if I think of those like Bezier curves as well, that's gonna define a tensor product Bezier patch, okay? Um, so another way of putting it is that if I keep U constant and I vary V, or if I keep V constant and I vary U, both of those will give me Bezier curves. Okay, and this leads to something called a bicubic Bezier surface. By the way, the term bicubic here means that like if I keep U fixed, I look at it as a function of V, that's a cubic function of V and vice versa. What that means is that in total, the degree of my surface is six, right? Because I could have up to something cubic in U multiplied by something cubic in V. And it's defined by 16 control points, right? I can think of them like, the control points for the uh, segments uh, as they get swept along. Uh, and the way that they get swept is using control points in the other two directions. And everything here ends up kind of symmetrically. I could also think of it as taking these curves uh, going horizontally and sweeping them in the vertical direction, or I could think of the vertical uh, curves being swept left to right. Turns out not to matter. So overall, um, what can we do to write out our curve? Well, let's essentially continue our discussion from before. So in general, let's ignore the verb, the V parameter for a second. If I had a uh, Bezier curve and it had four control points, P1, P2, P3, and P4, I know the function that traces out that Bezier curve um, just by using the, uh, the basis that we've already written down, right? The Bernstein basis function. So now, well, what is the Bezier control point as a function of V? Well, that's also a Bezier curve, right? So in particular, I can reuse the same Bernstein basis function uh, and now plug in the control points for that V curve. And that's gonna give me my bicubic tensor product patch. So let's see what, what happens. Essentially, um, we have these two expressions here. I can take this expression and plug it into the previous one. And what I get is what I'm showing you on the bottom of the slide. Essentially, I have a curve or now a uh, surface patch, which is a function of U and V. 
and the Bezier functions get used twice, right? This inner one is to trace out the V curves. And then the outer guy traces out the U curves. Okay, now if we do a little bit of algebra, I can take the uh, summations, I can gather them together. And what I get is just a, uh, a double sum. Oops, that should be a four. I'm sorry, I'll fix that in the slides. Uh, you know, just by essentially uh, pulling out this pij, and then I can define a new function bij, which is a product of bi of u times bj of v. So at the end of the day, essentially, I have 16 control points, all these pij's, and I have 16 basis functions, which are somehow separable, really, they're, they're, they're really the product of four uh, basis functions in u and v uh, independently. Okay, and so this is a sort of a very simple way to trace out a surface patch, um, which is by sweeping control points of a Bezier curve along Bezier curves, and that leads to 16 control points total. So here's a, a bit of a recap. Uh, essentially, a tensor Bezier patch um, is a parametric surface, meaning that it's a surface that's plotted out as a function of two variables u and v, which is cubic in u and v independently. It's defined by these 16 control points, so I can think of them like the control points of four curves um, that then are used to sweep one uh, object along the other. Uh, and the basis uh, functions of u and v are just the products of the Bernstein polynomials. At the bottom of the slide here, I show you an example of what these surfaces tend to look like. So I have these 16 control points, and you can see the surface kind of interpolates this nice cage that I've drawn. Uh, and in particular, uh, in the corners, it uh, meets up with the control points that I've drawn. Okay. Um, just like we can talk about tangents and normals for curves, we can also talk about tangents and normals for these nice differentiable surface patches. So if my surface is a function of u and v, you might remember from calculus class that I can get now two tangent vectors, right? So this is like uh, dp, I guess, du, and over here we have dp dv. Um, and these are gotten by essentially differentiating that parametric uh, surface function in the u and v direction. And now if I want a vector that is normal to the surface, like perpendicular to the surface, I can get it by just taking the cross product of these two tangent directions. Remember that cross product uh, is mutually orthogonal to the two things that are being multiplied. So that gives us the end direction uh, that's pointing up here. By the way, you guys should all rule, uh, do a little bit of review on your right hand rule. Remember that if I have u cross v, then I'm going to put my fingers at u, wrap them around v, and my thumb will point in the normal direction if I use my right hand. I'm going to be honest, I'm filming this and I'm unclear whether my software is going to mirror the uh, video or not. Um, so if you're following along at home, be sure to use your right hand <laughs> and to start with u and point in v even if it looks opposite from the video. Okay. Um, just for fun, I thought I'd introduce a little more notation that sometimes you see in computer-aided geometric design. Incidentally, that's the name of the field that studies this kind of stuff. Remember that we talked about this GBT factorization of a, a cubic curve where you have the geometry matrix with the control points, the spline matrix, which is defining the basis functions, and then the um, monomial basis all the way on the right-hand side. Um, a totally reasonable question you might ask is, can I do a similar thing with the surface patches? This is a little bit of an advanced topic, but in case you're curious, uh, the answer is yes, but notationally it's kind of annoying. <laughs> um, so this isn't required, but it's kind of convenient. Um, if I want uh, a surface patch in U and V, um, I can write three functions for the X, Y, and Z coordinate of the point. An astute mathematician here might notice that this is really a tensor being constructed, but that's okay. Um, and you can factor the expression we had on the previous slide by putting the x coordinates of all 16 control points in a 4 by 4 matrix, and then pre and post multiplying that 4 by 4 matrix by the, Bezi, uh, by the Bezier uh, functions evaluated at u and v um, respectively. So this is just like fancy, slick matrix notation for what's written in blue here. If you prefer what's written in blue, 
fine by me. Um, so this is just some nice uh, patch notation. So just like we had that GBT factorization for curves, um, for surfaces it's a little more annoying because you have your basis in your bicubic surface twice. If you sort of pre and post multiply that by a square matrix of um, control points, uh, and you have to do this separately for each coordinate. If you don't follow this, it's okay. It's just an advanced topic. That's just a nice kind of algebra uh, way of thinking about this stuff. And if you like more advanced stuff, Google what a tensor is. Is yes, it's the same tensor as like TensorFlow um, if you're into deep learning, uh, which can be used to uh, factor this surface uh, notation in an even nicer fashion, like combining X, Y, and Z. Okay. Um, we talked about tensor product Bezier surfaces. You can also do tensor product B-spline patches. That's perfectly fine. And it just means that you use a different basis uh, for the uh, curves that you're using to kind of sweep out your 3D surface. No big deal. Still four by four control points per patch. Um, the the B-spline version of the story um, is a little easier to work with if you're trying to get your patches to match up in a nice smooth way. But it's actually not a thousand percent obvious how to do it. This is an advanced topic. So in particular, you know, if I'm trying to make a really complicated surface out of these B-spline patches, right, it's not enough to just join them left to right. I also have to join them up and down, right? So I end up with like a grid of patches. And getting the right degree of continuity in the corners of that grid is, is kind of a tricky problem to think about. Okay, so essentially we've covered another surface representation. The pros are that it's smooth and defined by reasonably small set of points, right? 16 to be specific. The cons are that they're harder to render. Usually we have to convert these things to triangles. And it's, it's tricky to ensure the right degree of continuity at the patch boundaries. And, and just like there were extensions of the uh, curve representations we talked about, there are also extensions of the uh, surface representations by using homogeneous coordinates and other tricks uh, like nerves. Um, one of the most famous tensor product uh, surfaces uh, is something known as the Utah teapot. This is one of the early computer graphics uh, examples, and it's used all over the place in literature to test out rendering systems and so on. Um, and so kind of a fun fact, if you look on the right hand side of this, of the slide, I'm sorry, it's kind of low resolution. Um, you can actually see the different, uh, Bezier, uh, patches that were used to define this surface. This is one of the easier ones because essentially it was being wrapped around, um, in one direction. You didn't have to get things to meet up with a high degree of continuity too often. Now, one thing you might notice is that these surfaces are really smooth looking, um, and obviously, a lot of times we have very fine texture on the 3D geometry that we see in video games and movies. Um, so it might make sense to use tensor product surfaces to model the sort of coarse geometry of a 3D object. But then to add fine geometry, you might want to use some other piece of machinery. So one technique for doing that is something called displacement mapping, um, very common technique, where what you'll do is you'll model the coarse geometry of your surface using um, a technique like tensor products. And then inside of your algorithm, you'll go ahead and tessellate that, right? You'll fill it with triangles. And then you can um, store separately a displacement like along the normal direction, um, which is providing some of the finer scale geometry. So for example, uh, in this figure down here, probably the sphere was modeled uh, using one of these simple CAD representations, you know, B-splines, whatever. Um, and then they have this image patch, which gets wrapped around the sphere and displaces it along its normal uh, to add some of this cool texture, right? So this is all just to say that these different representations can be mixed and matched in clever ways. Here's another example of a character that uh, looks smooth and then displacement mapping has been used to add detail to it. Now, this is just one piece of machinery for modeling 3D surfaces, and there are many others. Um, another really common one that you guys should be aware of. We'll spend just a few minutes talking about uh, some basic techniques here. Um, it's something called subdivision surfaces. So the idea of subdivision surface is that I start with a coarse piece of geometry, like the bunny on the left-hand side, and I'm gonna come up with rules for essentially taking the coarse uh, triangles uh, on the original bunny and subdividing them into smaller triangles in a way that makes it look smooth. And one thing that people often do uh, in subdivision surface universe is prove that 
if you repeat this procedure uh, kind of ad nauseum, uh, the limit will approach a smooth surface like what we show on the right. Now, this is a technique that's used all the time in the entertainment industry. Uh, a landmark uh, in subdivision surfaces uh, was a short by Pixar uh, called Jerry's Game. Here I show you an image. Um, actually, it was a landmark in both subdivision and cloth simulation. One thing you guys might not know is that the little short uh, movies that are shown in front of the full feature films are oftentimes like nice test beds for different new technologies. Um, so Jerry's Game is a cute uh, story about an old guy playing chess and I encourage you guys to watch it at home and it kind of holds up today even though the graphics were all the way from 1997 um, and the chess pieces on the board and some of the other features were modeled uh, using the subdivision machinery for the first time in a major uh, motion picture film. So here's a really simple example of a subdivision piece of geometry um, using an algorithm called corner cutting. So let's say that I define, we're going to go back to curves for a minute. And let's say I define this uh, simple set of curve segments here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take every edge uh, and I'm going to divide it in a one, three split, right? So you can see what I've done here. Uh, it's divided these two adjacent edges in a one, three split and uh, added a little dotted line. And now I'm going to cut that dotted line like what I've shown you here. Okay, now I can do that for every single corner, and that introduces these, well, what I'm realizing now are, oh, ever so slightly blue uh, segments, but essentially it just rounds out the corners. And I could take that procedure, and I could apply it again, and again, and so on. And one thing that you can convince yourself is that this corner cutting procedure, uh, sometimes it's known as, as Chaikin's algorithm, actually produces a quadratic B-spline uh, curve uh, where the uh, points that you drew on the original guy are the control points um, for the uh, full smooth uh, object that you get. So this is a simple example of a technique that we also saw last time uh, in de Castle-Jo's algorithm, um, where you have a simple rule for subdivision that actually leads you to a smooth object. And that's this idea of subdivision curves and surfaces is that we're going to do things like cutting corners out of a coarse piece of geometry um, and then maybe add new control points that are some average of the old ones. Uh, and that's what's going to lead us uh, to our smooth object. So I'm running low on time, but we'll really briefly mention two strategies for subdivision. Uh, and these are built out of different uh, sort of complexes. One is built out of triangles. So it takes a set of triangles and gives you more triangles. <laughs> And the other is built on uh, quadrilaterals uh, for the basic control uh, representation. And so these two subdivision rules are known as loop and catmull clark subdivision, uh, respectively. Let's talk about loop subdivision first. So here's two triangles. Now I'm going to take every edge in my triangle mesh. I'm going to divide it into two and introduce a bunch of new vertices. Right? So essentially, I'm going to inscribe a triangle in the interior of every one of my old triangles. And this gives me the topology or the connectivity of a subdivided triangle mesh. Right? So I started with two triangles, and I ended up with, uh, well, eight triangles, I think. Yep, one, two, three, four, eight. <laughs> um, so uh, essentially, I've, what I've given you is a technique for taking a triangle mesh and introducing new vertices. Of course, I haven't told you where to put these vertices to make your mesh smooth, but at least you can see that topologically, like in terms of just a list of triangles, it's not so hard uh, to take a triangle mesh and um, generate one with more triangles <laughs> uh, in a way that has connectivity that kind of resembles that of the input. One kind of interesting observation, by the way, that I'll let you think about at home. Notice that all of these blue vertices that we added, they have six outgoing neighbors. That's not a mistake. That's actually a byproduct of uh, Euler characteristic. Um, and it defines an object called a semi-regular mesh where almost all the vertices have valence six. And the more times that I repeat this subdivision rule, the closer my mesh will get to being regular. So, so far I've given you the topology, like I've given you how to take a triangle and insert new vertices and like how to connect them up with uh, their neighbors uh, in order to make a triangle mesh with more vertices but I have to tell you where to place these blue points. In the loop subdivision scheme, what you do, uh, which is 
a little bit tricky uh, is you actually follow two steps. The first is you place the blue points, and then you actually update the positions of the red points. Um, we're not going to cover in this course the details of how these rules are derived. I'm giving them on the slide just for completeness to show you that it's really not so hard to implement. So in the loop subdivision scheme, the position of the blue point is given by a weighted average of the red points that are its neighbors using a 3/8, 3/8, 1/8, 1/8 ratio, depending on whether it's adjacent or kind of flipped from that vertex. Uh, and then in a second step of the loop subdivision scheme, you actually replace the uh, the red points with weighted averages of the red points and their neighbors. Now, my understanding of the history of these subdivision schemes is that a lot of them were actually derived with just kind of guess and check strategies um, for like, oh, okay, well, I inserted this red vertex in my mesh. I kind of want it to be some neighbor, some average of the neighbors, uh, and now I need to smooth out my, my mesh a little bit, which is why I maybe use some ratios like this. But these are actually chosen super carefully so that if you iterate this procedure, you get something smooth. Um, so for instance, here's one of the chess pieces. I think this is from Jerry's game. Uh, and you can see that as I run this loop subdivision uh, procedure, I actually get a nice smooth surface of, of revolution here. So uh, that's the sort of nice trick is that the artist might only want to design this coarse set of points, but that's already enough to define a smooth shape behind the scenes. Camel clark subdivision um, can operate on a more generic mesh. It doesn't need triangles, which is a good thing because it also doesn't output triangles. Uh, but it uh, is a, a pretty popular option, so it's worth mentioning. So here's a generic mesh. <laughs> so the sub the clark, oof, the Catmull clark subdivision rule, um, topologically, so like where it places new vertices on the mesh and kind of hooks them all together, is a bit different from loop subdivision. What you do is you introduce a lot of new vertices. The first ones are called face points. So for every triangle or quad, you're going to introduce a new vertex. Conceptually, we can think of it at the center of this object. That's not going to actually matter, but uh, conceptually, it's okay to think about it that way. In addition to that, we're going to create edge points, which subdivide the edges. This is just like loop subdivision. And now we're going to hook them together by taking every new face point and connecting it to its four, or however many, like in this case, three neighboring edge points. So this gives you the connectivity of a new mesh. And the question is just where to place the blue points and if I want to move the red points in our subdivision procedure. So there is a geometric strategy for completeness. I'll outline it here. Um, again, this isn't terribly important. But essentially, for each uh, new face point, I can write it as just the average or the centroid of the uh, old uh, face points that were nearby. For each new edge point, it'll be the average of the two old points and the two new face points, which I just placed in the previous rule. Uh, and uh, now the old points, like the red guys that were originally on the mesh, um, I can write as some average of the neighboring points that I just placed. So this is a simple strategy. Again, you should just think of it like kind of smoothing out your mesh. Um, here you can see an example of catmull clark subdivision, which started with a very simple uh, polyhedron. And as I apply the subdivision rule, eventually I can reach a surface that looks like a sphere. In fact, if uh, I use a certain uh, cubic uh, basis, I can actually approach a sphere. Okay, so that's the, the catmull clark subdivision rule. So from a high level here, Subdivision curves and surfaces have a lot of advantages. You can have arbitrary topology, like I could uh, take a triangle mesh of a donut and apply loop subdivision to it. That's perfectly fine. Um, they're smooth at the boundaries between the triangles or the quads or what have you, if you subdivide enough times. And they're sort of scalable in the sense that if I have a really fast computer, I could run subdivision more times and get a smoother surface. But if my video game detects that my CPU power is limited, um, then I could do it at a coarser level of detail. It's a relatively simple representation. It's just a mesh, but a coarse one. Um, and it's pretty easy to code these sorts of things. Um, there are some disadvantages. I mean, these are not parametric surfaces. In fact, if I just gave you the loop or catmull clark subdivision rules, I would challenge you to convince yourself that if you repeat them enough times, you'll get something smooth. 
it's not so easy. It's actually pretty hard to prove that that'll happen. Um, and it's even harder to, for example, define these surfaces parametrically. Um, another detail that we didn't really cover is that sometimes things can go wrong in these subdivision rules, uh, special vertices, like ones that aren't degree six on a triangle mesh. Um, so some special things have to happen there to smooth out the surface. Now, just like before, we can combine these strategies, like here is a, a subdivision surface to give the course geometry, and then somebody used a displacement map to get the, uh, the final uh, model that you see on the left-hand side. Uh, and these are the sorts of things that people do in practice. They use all kinds of different surface representations kind of stirred together into the pot uh, to create one shape. Now, briefly, just for fun, I thought I'd mention one other surface representation that's popular, uh, for example, in computational fluid dynamics. Uh, that's implicit surfaces. Um, these are completely different. Um, they're actually also popular very recently in deep learning. Um, because, uh, for example, I could parameterize the function f uh, using a neural network easily enough. But uh, in any event, an implicit surface, uh, you define a function on all of space. Remember that a surface is two-dimensional, but space is three-dimensional. Your implicit uh, function here is a function of all three variables. And the zero level set is going to be the set of points on the curve. This is kind of nice um, in certain situations, like it's easy to blob together different things like in other words to have changes in topology whereas like if i had a triangle mesh of like a donut and i wanted a new triangle mesh where i like chopped that donut along a line that wouldn't be so easy uh, to edit so topological changes tend to be kind of nice in the implicit surface world which is super useful for fluids on the other hand um, it's a little bit tricky to actually extract a mesh and render uh, a surface in this uh, form um, so that's the basic trade-off here. So in any event, the, uh, the world of curves and surfaces is a really large one in computer graphics. We're only scratching the surface, as it were. Um, but hopefully you guys have some appreciation for how you can construct uh, smooth surfaces uh, and smooth curves. Uh, and if you're interested in learning even more about this, I encourage you to take more classes in mechanical engineering or to take my geometry class in the spring. So with that, I'll uh, see you next time.